Hello and welcome to the special online version of History 103 for Friday, February 10th, 2017. What I want to talk about today is essentially the transformations of the second half of the 19th century. Um, and this is uh, the period when really Europeans and North Americans to a lesser degree come to dominate or come to influence the world in ways that weren't possible before. And this process I want to trace for you uh, really features the kind of two interlocking processes, really. Uh, on the one hand, the transformation and the expansion of ideas about the nation, nationalism, uh, and, and, and nation-state building. And on the other hand, imperialism, you know, the particular form of expansion that happens, uh, empire building in the second half of the 19th century. Now, we've encountered nationalism before, right? We've argued that it was partially a product of the French Revolution, this idea of belonging, the idea that political authority rested on the will of the inhabitants and not, you know, in the body of the monarch. Uh, and we also argued that nationalism was the sense of belonging to or uh, promoting some community known as the nation, which was... Uh, which was defined by some things in common, whether it was a shared language, shared story about uh, historical descent, shared assumptions about race, a shared history, etc. Now, we argued at least that the French Revolution was very instrumental in unleashing and transforming nationalism, but as we'll see here, nationalism it doesn't matter for the next half of the 19th century, the first half of the 19th century. Uh, nationalism really only comes to matter much more uh, in the last 50 years of the, of the 19th century, if that. Uh, particularly is something that lots and lots of people uh, identify with. Um, and the point there is that even as we're talking about the, sort of the rise of modern nationalism in the second half of the 19th century, to get people to identify with the nation as opposed to their village or their ethnic community or their religion uh, requires a lot of work and is kind of an incomplete process. Nation building, as I'll point out, goes hand in hand with uh, territorial expansion, particularly in the Americas, and imperialism for Europeans uh, and, and for North Americans too. Imperialism, when we use this term, we're, we're, we're referring to a particular kind of expansion, uh, one that is characterized by the political and economic inequality between the expanding power, the imperializing power, and the territory that it's expanding into. It's marked basically by a power dynamic, the subordination of a client or satellite state into the world, into the sort of orbit of a more powerful host. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be direct political control, which we often think, you know, happens with, with, some, with empire. We, we often associate that specifically with the term colonialism, sort of creating official political units called colonies abroad. Um, and imperialism is a little more subtle than that. It's more about this power dynamic of, of uh, expansion and inequality. Uh, because, for instance, you could look at uh, what develops in Latin America by the end of the 19th century, where places like Argentina are very, very tied closely to the British economy, but they are not formally colonies of Great Britain. So imperialism when we're talking about it here, really just refers to the sense of expansion that is framed by political and economic inequality, where you have a client or satellite state that's subordinated under a more powerful host. And of course, when we talk about imperialism too, we're also talking about the acceleration of industrialism that permits the world to be knitted together in new ways on European and North American terms. Okay, there's my point about direct political control. Better late than never. Well, let me talk about this process of nation building and expansion first actually in the Americas. And I'm going to look at the United States, I'm going to look at Canada, Canada's moment of glory. I'm also going to look at Brazil. And I'm going to showcase the similarities between all three of these. All three of these New World territories that become, to some degree or other, nation states in the second half of the 19th century based on prosperity, industrialization, um, and expanding in all cases westward, to include frontier territories into the polity. Uh, but all three of them, as I'll show you, face obstacles about who kind of belonged to the nation. So the idea of creating the nation takes work and also is fraught with inequalities.
Well, that is probably pretty obvious in the case of the United States, and it's a story that I think you probably know uh, quite well. The idea that it was God's will for the United States to push westward, the phrase we use, manifest destiny, was coined in the 1840s, but it was applied to a process that was already happening. Uh, the, first, the United States had been expanding westward via purchase agreements and treaties with France, Spain, and Britain, uh, warfare with Native American peoples and with Mexico. That process had already been en route you know, through the 18, you know, well through the first half of the 19th century. Of course, the United States will continue to expand westward uh, in the era of this, well, in the run-up to the Civil War. And in fact, the question about the, you know, whether or not these new territories in, in the Midwest and, and West should be slave, should permit slave owning or not, is you know, part of the controversy that underlies the Civil War too. So I'm not going to talk about the Civil War, that's what your other classes are for, but just point out that you know, the dynamic of westward expansion is certainly part of the American experience in the 19th century. We live in California, but of course California is a site too of rapid migration, not just for people who are living you know, on the North American continent, but for other people too, people from Latin America, people from Australia, Asia, Europe, and this is of course after you know, 1840 and onward. In the wake of the Civil War, a new nationalism arises in the United States. Thinking about the United States, for instance, as a singular noun, the United States is, as opposed to uh, a plural noun, which is the way it was often described before the Civil War, the United States are something. Um, so the Civil War and the victory of the North helps create a, a reforged sense of American nationalism. This is tied to rising industrial prosperity, and the settlement of the Plains states, by, particularly by uh, you know, settlers of European descent, um, with along that comes rising agricultural productivity that is helping feed this growing nation. But of course, this process also entails the marginalization of Native peoples and the remarginalization of African Americans after the Civil War. So very much as the United States, you know, sort of, I would say, cultivates a more aggressive and uh, singular sense of nationalism in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, part of that process is, is, is exclusion, determining those people, particularly um, Native Americans, African Americans, uh, women too, I would say, uh, who were still denied citizenship and belonging to this nation. And here we get the sense too of the expansion westward of the Americas. What about Canada, you might ask? Well, let me tell you. Uh, nation building is going on here too in terms of expansion westward, although in the Canadian case it's mostly done uh, to ward off potential U.S. claims on uh, what becomes Canadian territory. Uh, here's a handy image of the sort of the scope of the Dominion of Canada when it is formally created in 1867, and you can see it's quite limited, right? And much of the rest of this territory is officially belongs to the United Kingdom to Great Britain. Well, Canada eventually does, of course, move westward. By 1898, you can see that Manitoba and British Columbia are formerly uh, provinces of Canada, and then you have Yukon, Northwest, Kiwatin, and, and, and such as, as t affiliated territories. So in that, in that roughly 30-plus year span, Canada has moved westward, and as well as the territory that is under Canadian control has expanded. Part of the problem, though, well, so I, to go back here, Canada is officially independent by an 1867 Act of Parliament uh, decreed by the, uh, well, the British Parliament. And so this actually is part of the problem in uh, creating a dynamic sense of Canadianness or Canadian identity, uh, because unlike in the American case, or at least the case of the United States, where uh, that American identity that emerges really after the American Revolution is in opposition to Great Britain, in Canada there's never that sense of, of separation, and so uh, it's sort of harder to cultivate a sense of what's distinctly Canadian. Uh, there are also difficulties in cultivating this sense of, of, of nation, of Canadianness, uh, that are, well, there are a handful of them. For one hand, there's difficulties, frankly, in attracting settlers to the western western districts of Canada, given the uh, the weather, um, the harsh climate, the short growing season. Uh, the Canadian government will have to create very strong incentives, like subsidizing rail passage and, and land purchasing, for to try to get stimulate movement west. Uh, and then there are certainly other peoples within 
the Canadian polity who don't want to be included or don't identify with this sense of English-speaking Canadianness. Uh, of course, the French speakers who are in Quebec, uh, who are there and who very much don't feel a part of this Anglophone or English-oriented Canada. Uh, and the Native peoples out West, uh, to a lesser degree than in the case of the United States, but so certainly to a significant degree, Canadian expansion is marked by sort of uneasy relations with Native peoples and periodic uh, uprisings like the uh, 1869-70 uh, Red River Rebellion led by Louis Riel, uh, etc. So expanding westward was part of the process of creating an autonomous and independent Canada, uh, but it didn't really create sort of a, a, a really fully-fledged Canadian identity. Let me just also mention, uh, in the case of Latin America, we could talk about any number of the sort of the post-wars of independent states here, uh, but thinking about Brazil is another example of a nation-state that's expanding in the second half of the 19th century. Nation-building here is, is, is sort of predicated on, well, it's partially predicated on expansion into the Amazonian rainforest, uh, taking advantage of a, of a boom in rubber, rubber cultivation in the last couple decades of the 19th century. Uh, but Brazilian identity here is very much tied to uh, racial categories and a sense of exclusion, too. Uh, the, the Brazilian state in the late 19th century is very exclusive. There are very severe restrictions on suffrage that eliminate many, that is to say, voting. Uh, very, it's, it's very, very limited in terms of who actually can participate in electoral politics, and of course there were very real racial boundaries, particularly that uh, disenfranchised and excluded the descendants uh, of uh, former slaves. Um, slavery, of course, actually is not abolished until 1888, so that lingers on in any way, too. So what I would say for all three of these, for the United States, for Canada, and for Brazil, is that over the second half of the 19th century, expansion westward is part of the process of uh, sort of building a sense of nation, uh, but there are always are exclusions and obstacles to this process. Okay. There's the, this is the Opera House, by the way, in Manaus, in, in the Amazonian rainforest in Brazil, uh, very much modeling the, uh, the cultural aspirations of the largely European-oriented European uh, settlers who are there, trying to showcase that Manaus is just as sophisticated as, as a place like Paris, except it was hot and malarial. This is the Opera House, by the way, that I think it's sort of referring to in Paris. Okay, if we shift our lens back to Europe during this period, there's similarly, we eventually see in the second half of the 19th century, the growing importance of nationalism and, and what I would call nation building, uh, with some similar sorts of obstacles to what I've pointed out in the Americas. Um, ironically, to go back just a little bit, and this slide is of, of Italy, but bear with me here. Um, Again, we've highlighted the way that nationalism was really unleashed by the French Revolution, uh, in large part. But then, really, nationalism is pretty irrelevant for the first half of the 19th century in Europe. You know, there are maybe small groups of students in the German-speaking world or the Italian-speaking world who are making noises about having an independent Italy or an independent Germany. Uh, but by and large, after Napoleon is defeated, uh, Europe is dominated by conservative monarchies. Um, the monarchies that had been there beforehand, uh, and nationalism is really pretty irrelevant. Now, there's an upsurge in sort of nationalist agitation in 1848, in particularly in Central Europe, in the German-speaking lands uh, of the well, in the in the lands of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, or what it's actually the Habsburg Empire at this point, and uh, well, in the German-speaking world, in the sort of world of Central Europe, but also in the Italian peninsula, which is largely controlled uh, by, the, by the Habsburgs, by Austria. Uh, so there are revolts in 1848 that are crushed. That's the short version of the story. And if some of those people who are in revolt are agitating for uh, an idea of a nationalist, uh, or are motivated by the idea of nationalism, but it's still pretty minimal. In fact, when we see two new nation states created in the 1860s, and, well, 1860s particularly, um, Italy and Germany, it's not really because of a groundswell of nationalist sentiment at all. Rather, it's because of ambitious smaller states that are building their power uh, and sort of absorbing others. In the case of what becomes Italy, uh, Italy becomes unified over the course of the 1860s, well, 
in the first couple of years of the 1860s, the process was more or less completed by 18, uh, 1870, as this image makes clear. Um, but the unification of Italy is all about the power politics of the Kingdom of Sardinia, or Piedmont Sardinia here, um, which is this greenish color initially, that uh, quite cannily expands its power at the expense of Austria, uh, which again had really was, had the upper hand in the Italian peninsula up until the 1860s. Um, and I don't really need to get into all these details here, but the whole point is that there are a series of wars that weaken the power of, of Austria and allow for, well, well there's one war and then some uh, uprisings that weaken the power of Austria and uh, produce this unified Italy, unified around the kingdom of Piedmont, um, not really driven by the idea of nationalism at all. Something similar happens in the case of German unification, which really is, you know, happens because of a series of conflicts, first with Denmark, uh, and then with uh, Austria, and then with France, that produce, by 1871, a unified uh, German kingdom built around, basically, the expansion of the, of the Prussian kingdom. And again here, yes, there are people who are talking about German, you know, uniting all Germans under one kingdom, uh, but the di driving force is the ambitions of one state, and that's Prussia, uh, to sort of cajole and bring other German-speaking speaking states under its orbit. Even as you know, Germany and Italy become nations, nation states rather, uh, by the end of the 1860s, the, the challenge remains, that is, how do you get people in these newly unified territories to identify as Italians or as Germans? Um, and that process takes a lot of work. In the case of Italy, it never really succeeds. Most there are all sorts of divides that prevent people from really uh, identifying as Italian. Uh, in the German case, it's a little bit more successful, but there's still multiple obstacles. But this is this question of getting people to sort of belong to the nation and determining who belongs is also you know, a dilemma for Great Britain. Um, Great Britain, which is faced in the last couple decades of the 19th century with increasing agitation in Ireland. It's a problem for France, where even in the last couple decades of the 19th century, you still have uh, all sorts of regional languages that people speak that are almost incompatible in some cases with what we now think of as French. This is an exciting language map uh, of the various dialects spoken in France. And uh, so part of the idea of, of building nations or creating uh, a sense of, of people belonging to a nation in the, in the last couple decades of the 19th century uh, involves, in the case of France, getting everybody to learn French and identifying with France as a whole. How do they do this? It's done in a variety of ways. Uh, compulsory primary schooling, military service, road building. These are all processes that help facilitate people identifying with the nation as opposed to their own district. But it takes time, and it's not a smooth process. And my cat is just attacking my hand. Please don't do that. Okay, moving on. The era of nation building, then, so I guess to wrap all this up, we're talking in the, in the second half of the 19th century about nation building and consolidation, but there were still unanswered questions about who was to be included within the idea of the nation. Uh, and this is in an era when I should point out that more and more adult men are participating in politics. They're, they're coming to acquire some sort of say or a vote in, in the way politics is gone. Well, the surge in the way, in the, or the increase rather in, the, in uh, nationalist affiliation and nationalism is part of the driving process too of imperial expansion that's happening in the last couple decades of the 19th century and I, particularly for Europeans and I want to talk about that now so I want to shift to thinking about imperialism so to demonstrate at least in the ways that nation building and nationalism is one of those forces that contributes to uh, to imperialist expansion not all though what do I mean by imperialist expansion in the last part of the 19th century well, really, the last two decades of the 19th century see the extension of much more direct European and, and in just a few cases, well, as we'll see, uh, North American control over most of the globe. We'll see some exceptions when we come back next week, but uh, our narrative here particularly is of the way that Europeans come to dominate Africa and Asia in the last two decades of the 19th century. As you can see from this map, by 
1912, all of Africa, save for two independent states, uh, Liberia here in the west, and, uh, and uh, Ethiopia in the east, or Abyssinia as it was called, um, are under European control. Most of this is being done by the French and the British, but also those new European states, Germany and Italy, uh, are also sort of acquiring a toehold, at least, in imperial expansion. Uh, Portugal, for what it's worth, still has some uh, vestigial colonies, that is to say, carryovers from its old empire in Mozambique, Angola, and, and a couple of other places. In s s and much of this control over Africa is, is formalized uh, by the Berlin Conference of 1884-85, where the Europeans sort of meet to divvy up or, or agree on who was going to have influence where in Africa, of course, without the uh, advice and consent of Africans themselves. In Southeast Asia, the British expand, and British, of course, have already, well, they're already in India and Burma, or Birmani, as this map refers to it, because it's a French map. Um, but the British will expand their influence into what is now Malaysia, what they call Malaya and Burma. Uh, the French will solidify their control over what we would call into China, so that it is uh, you know, Vietnam, Cambodia, um, what is now Laos. Um, and this takes place over really the, particularly over the last three decades of the, of the 19th century. The Dutch are going to consolidate their control in Indonesia, and they're actually going to intensify the sort of the nature of colonial rule there. And uh, meanwhile, up north, the Russians are basically expanding to the east. Their expansion is only halted by Japan in 1904-05. This is an exciting map of, of the Dutch East Indies. And you can see really here that, that the bulk of sort of, sort of, that there had been a Dutch nucleus there for quite some time by 1800. Uh, but really it's in that period between 1871 and 1940 that the Dutch theoretically come to acquire direct control over the rest of these islands. And so we get this map of the modern world that is divvied up mostly by Europeans, although, of course, uh, the United States has gotten into the imperial game in the very last few years of the 19th century at the expense of Spain after the Spanish-American War, uh, whereby the Americans come to acquire control over Puerto Rico, uh, the Philippines, and uh, Cuba to a certain extent. Well, why? How, why do we, how can we explain this, uh, really this transformation in the way that Europeans are interact and North Americans are interacting with the rest of the world? Well, for one, the expansion of empire is driven by the lure of economic gain and the lure of potential profits and resources to exploit. It's also driven by the chance to uh, for ambitious individuals to create vast personal for personal fortunes. You know, think of Cecil Rhodes in South Africa. Uh, you know, taking advantage of, of of diamonds and gold mining. Um, governments are also being per pressure to expand abroad in order to protect their existing commercial interests that are already there. You know, so for instance, if the British already have some sort of trading post or trading facility, uh, in, the in, the, in this period we see often protecting commercial interests as a justification for creating some sort of formal political control, like some sort of actual sort of colonizing presence. Nationalism is part of this process, too, in, in, in ways that you might not expect. And so I, it, the whole point of that section earlier in this lecture about, you know, sort of the importance, the rising importance of nationalism and the nation-state was uh, to point out that, that getting people to identify with a nation as opposed to something else um, eventually produces uh, a result where, whereby people are you know, sort of invested and, in, you know, sort of have pride in the nation and see empire as a way of expanding the influence of the particular nation. And so governments actually increasingly are being driven by both by groups that want to push for imperial expansion, but also by the public at large who see that, you know, expanding abroad or sort of traipsing around Africa is a key to uh, enhancing prestige. So in other words, governments have to respond to public opinion, which now is increasingly nationalistic. Uh, in the last couple decades of the 19th century. Empire is also justified, and least motivated, by uh, a set of religious and moral imperatives, whether these were, uh, you know, trying to officially stamp out the slave trade in Africa, 
or uh, converting the so-called heathen to Christianity, the sense that maybe some sort of formal political control was necessary for this to happen. Now, this is very, very much the language of that famous Rudyard Kipling poem, The White Man's Burden, you know, take up the white man's burden, uh, send forth the best ye breed, etc., etc. It goes on in nauseating detail. Um, of course, it's the language of the 19th century. And here, the, the rhetoric, and we may come back and talk about this in class on Monday, is very much about how expansion, colonialism, or empire building, is not something that Europeans are doing just for, you know, tawdry economic gain or, and, and uh, promoting nationalist power, but it's because it's a moral duty to civilize the uncivilized. Now, of course, this is very much tied to a growing racist, a quote-unquote scientific racist understanding of the world in the late 19th century. Uh, Darwin's theories about evolution have been given some sort of weirdo gloss and have been applied to human, well, basically, the discipline of anthropology to sort of creates a justification for Europeans and, and North Americans uh, for dominating the rest of the globe, that there was they were somehow at the top, at the end of the racial evolutionary chain. Okay, so that's the this notion of the white man's burden, this, this notion to civilize. Now, I would suggest to you that these religious and moral justifications for empire are almost always applied after the fact, and they're always sort of secondary to those other two. But, you know, keep them in mind for what they are. And finally, this is not so much a motivation, but it's a precondition. It's, it's that what makes this possible, what makes it possible for Europeans and to a certain extent North Americans to expand beyond their own frontiers, um, the ability to harness industrial power to... Uh, all sorts of things to, to travel, uh, to mass produce things, to steamships, to develop new kinds of weaponry. And uh, medically, for instance, uh, medical breakthroughs that allow Europeans to not die from malaria, which is the and other diseases, but particularly malaria, which has been the big obstacle to penetrating uh, the, the heartland of Africa uh, up until really the like, 1840s. Um, similarly, uh, it had been an obstacle for Southeast Asia. And uh, the whole story of how malaria is at least sort of held at bay is really interesting. It involves stealing plants from the Andes in, in South America and uh, growing the chinchona plant, um, or taking a chinchona tree, I guess, or bush, uh, and taking its bark to use as a, as a prophylactic. That is something to ward off malaria, not to, not to prevent it from... from well, well, to prevent it from, from, from happening, uh, but not to be immunized against it. So that, that's sort of a subplot in the, in the way that empire works. So all of these factors, I think, combine to help explain why in the last three decades of the 19th century, particularly, uh, the world is very much colored in European and, and North American tones. The result is, a com is really a, a process through which uh, the major European powers and the lesser ones too come to dominate the rest of the world. This is a process that doesn't really uh, have a lot of casualties for the part of Europeans, but of course it requires an enormous amount of violence that's exerted over Africans and Asians. Um, some, some groups don't resist very much, others uh, display considerable resistance like in the Philippines, for instance, in reaction to American colonialism in the early 1900s. And we'll come back to this notion of, of late 19th century responses to imperialism when we meet again next week. Okay, well, hopefully that kept your attention. Thanks for listening. That was a short but sweet lecture, and I will see you all on Monday.